How's everyone? Seem quiet today. Feel like Monday or what? A little bit. So uh, we have an exam, don't we, on Thursday? Our first exam, and it'll cover um, everything that we've done up to and including what we do today, which I know is a bit of a challenge. Um, I don't know. We may just start stop at partial fractions. Uh, let's just see how things go today. Uh, because the evaluating definite integrals, uh, 5, 2, 3, and 4, those are actually, compared to what we're doing, relatively easy. So um, let's just see how things feel today. Um, any questions over homework? Anything you want me to go over? I know that you all worked very hard to get that all done. No? You didn't get any sleep last night? That's no good. Yes. 324, number 9. Uh, 324? Okay, no, it's all right. The sine squared, cosine squared one? All right. What was your particular question, just the whole thing, or, okay. It's a pretty ugly problem. So if you had an even sign, an even power on sine, I mean, sorry, odd power on sine or cosine, you would just peel off one of them, but they're both even. So anytime you see even powers on both sine and cosine, you know automatically you're going to be going to the power reducing formula. And since they're both even, that means they both get power reduced. So your first initial setup would be to rewrite sine squared as, let's see, how do you want to do it? You want to go one-half minus one-half cosine 2x. That would be the power reducing on this one. And then the cosine squared would become one-half plus one-half cosine 2x. That makes sense? Yeah? Okay, so each one of those, uh, we, can, we can factor out a one-half from, from each of these. So we get two factors of one-half that come out. So that can come out as a one-fourth. And we're left with 1 minus cosine 2x, uh, 1 plus cosine 2x, dx. So that was just to get rid of the fractions. And then, really, you have no option but to actually expand this out and see what it is. So multiply this all out. So that would be equal to 1 fourth integral, let's see, 1, and then what happens here? The middle ones will cancel out, right, because they're the same thing. They're just off by a sign. So all you're left with is that outside one, which is 1 minus cosine squared of 2x. Very important to remember that it's 2x, right, not x, so it looks like this. Then what? Any suggestions? No? I see I see like two different things you might want to do here. Um, one, you could just say, okay, I can integrate one, right? And then I have to integrate cosine squared 2x, but that is going to require another power reducing. Or you can just say, okay, 1 minus cosine squared of something is the same as sine squared. So switch it over to sine squared first. Either way, 
you're gonna, it's going to require another power reducing step. So I'm going to switch it over to sine squared 2x, because that's what that is, and then power reduce that. When I power reduce this, again, it's going to be 1 half minus 1 half, but this time what? Cosine 4x, because you're doubling the angle that was there. And then again, you can pull another factor of one half out. And then at this point, I think we're ready to go. We can integrate each one. Uh, so one eighth is going to stay here. The antiderivative of one with respect to x is just x. And what is the antiderivative? Uh, let's ignore the negative for now. What's the antiderivative of cosine 4x? 1 fourth sine 4x, right? 1 fourth sine 4x. So you have minus 1 fourth sine 4x. And plus some constant out here. And then just distribute through your 1 eighth and you're there. Make sense? Okay. Now, I, after looking at that, I'll leave that up for a second. Um, I actually kind of see something else we could have done in the very beginning that would have been even easier. But I don't know if you would have seen it. So let me show it to you. Um, the very beginning, you could have realized, do I need to go back down there for anyone? Are we good? OK, so in the very beginning, you could have realized that this is the same as integral sine x, cosine x, quantity squared, right? dx. And then that almost looks like a double angle identity. Remember the double angle identity looks like this. Uh, sine 2x equals 2 sine x cosine x. What I mean is the part inside, this right here, looks a lot like this side, doesn't it? Except that I don't have a 2 there. So what I could do if I wanted to be kind of clever here, I could rewrite this as 1 half times 2 sine x cosine x quantity squared dx. And do you see that the 1 half times 2 is just a 1? But this 2 sine x cosine x is actually now just what? Sine 2x, isn't it? And now if I have here, I'm kind of running out of space. If I have the 1 half times sine 2x, and I'm squaring that, then I can square each one, because there's multiplication right there. So I can square 1 half, which gives me what? 1 fourth, and I can square sine square 2x, and I'm exactly right here, aren't I? And then you continue. You do it, you do it the same way. I'm just showing you. I mean, it's an, another way of doing it. Good. All right, let's get into today's business. If there's any other questions on homework, we can hopefully talk about it at the break or something. Um, so last time we were starting this partial fraction section, I said there's a bunch of stuff that we, we can actually handle right now. And we saw that some of these were pretty straightforward. And some of them require quite a bit of work, especially these ones down here at the bottom, these uh, linear expressions over the irreducible quadratics or repeated irreducible quadratics. We had to like make the top look like the derivative of the bottom and then kind of peel things off. And then we'd have to complete the square. And it was a mess. But the idea is that we can handle that if, if need be. And that then led us into recalling what rational functions look like. You know, a polynomial over a polynomial, as long as the denominator is not zero. And here were some examples. And then I said, hey, there's, there's a whole strategy for going about these. Um, but the main thing is that you need to know how to do partial fraction decomposition. I asked you to go home and look at it, look at my old videos, research it. I don't know if you did. So hopefully you did. Um, I will go through these examples today. And 
I'll assume you kind of acquainted yourself with it a little bit, but if you have a question, you need to just let me know. And if it's something that I think you should have already figured out, I'll just say, hey, you know, I think you just need to go back and look at that, all right? Because we can't go through an entire um, lecture on partial fraction decomposition today. So these are the steps. I will refer to these steps, the strategy, all right, as I work through the, these examples. So, because if I start reading through, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. So let's start with this first example. So we want to integrate this. And, I mean, again, you have all these different techniques now. We're at the last technique. The things that we can probably throw out are it's not a trig integral, we don't see sine cosine. Um, how about a trig substitution? What are we looking for for trig substitutions? I did this example? Oh, we did this. Okay, thank you. Well, still, what, what, what are we looking for for trig substitution? That would be basic substitution, something in its derivative. The trig substitution is the one where you replace x with a sine theta or something like that. What you're looking for there is a square root somewhere in there, right? Square root of x squared minus a squared or square root of a squared minus x squared or square root of a squared plus x squared. There were three different ones. I don't see that anywhere. Basic substitution, I have to see something in its derivative. I don't see it, uh, but I do see it's a rational function. So I start thinking, okay, I'm going to go through the strategy. And we did this last time, so I'm not going to do it again. So I'm going to put a check here. Refer back to your notes. Thank you, Robert, for not making me work through that again. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So again, after going through all the different things I, that I know it's not, I'm going to say it's a rational function. And so the first step in the strategy, everyone have that down? x squared uh, plus 2x minus 1 over 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 2x. The strategy for this is to first inspect the degree of the numerator and denominator. If the degree of the numerator is less than the, the degree of the denominator, we move on to the next step, which is step, step 2. So in our case, the degree of the numerator is 2, degree of denominator is 3. Since it's smaller, we can move on to the next step. We don't have to do long division. Okay, that's good. So the next step is for the remaining rational function, use partial fraction decomposition to rewrite the expression. So what we want to try and do right now is see if we can take our rational function and factor it. That means factor the whole top, factor the whole bottom. And then we'll come back and take a look at which case we have. So. This will be equal to integral. How does the numerator factor, or does it? Does it factor? Doesn't appear to factor. How about the denominator? Well, you can pull at least an x out, right? And you're left with 2x squared plus 3x minus 2. And then what's in parentheses here? Trinomial, quadratic trinomial, that'll factor or no? Yes. What is it? 2x, 2, does that look right? 2x squared plus 4x, take away x, take away 2. So that is the correct factorization of the denominator, right? Understand? Okay. Now, of course, it's Cal 2. I'd expect you can do that. Um, what do we do next after we've factored? Uh, oops, I forgot. That's a minus 1 up here. Please change that. 
right here. I put plus, it was minus. If it was plus one, it would have factored, right? So the step now is to look at what we have. So first case would be the denominator. See, we don't really care about the numerator too much, all right? What we look at is denominator. The denominator has n distinct linear factors. So let's take a look at this. We have x, which is a factor, right? It's linear. 2x minus 1, again, is another factor because it's in parentheses. It's linear. 2x minus 1, the power on x is 1. It's linear. x plus 2, again, linear expression. We have three different linear expressions, right? So n distinct linear factors, in this case, three distinct linear factors. We all clear? Okay, so we have three distinct linear factors. So since we have three distinct linear factors, one, two, and three right there, we will do what? We will rewrite the integrand. Now the integrand is, is the rational function. Here it is, it's, it's the, the numerator over our factor denominator. And what we have to do is rewrite it with some constant over the first linear factor, some constant over the second linear factor, and keep going until you get out to the nth linear factor. In our case, we only have three. So we are going to rewrite just the integrand. So I'm, I'm kind of stopping here and I'm saying, all right, here comes partial fractions. So here's partial fraction decomposition. So I rewrite the original problem. Notice I don't have the in integral anymore because I'm, I'm going to go back to the integral after I'm done with this. And then I'm going to have three terms over here. A1 over the first linear factor, A2 over the second linear factor, which is 2x minus 1, and A3 over x plus 2. Now, just think about this. If we can somehow rewrite this so that it looks like this, where A1, A2, and A3 are just numbers, right? Then what we would have <clears throat> is a constant over a linear factor, constant over a linear factor, constant over a linear factor, if we can do it, right? And we already know from what we did last class that if we have a constant over a linear factor, we can integrate that with relative ease. So it's just a matter of can we get it to switch over from this to this. So this is where you come through, and you help me. You tell me what I should do here. Anyone? Anyone? I, I would try to get my wife to watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. She had never seen it. And like halfway through, she's like, do we have to finish this? I'm like, she's like, what happens? I go, he just has a good day, I guess. I don't know. But I'm thinking about the teacher, you know, sitting there. Anyone? Anyone? Voodoo economic. No? Yes, so you're multiplying the top by what's missing here, right? Essentially what you're doing is you're multiplying both sides of the equation by the, by the least common denominator. That's what you're doing, right? That's all, that's all that's happening. You're multiplying the left side of this by x times 2x minus 1 times x plus 2. You're multiplying the right side of this equation by the same thing, x times 2x minus 1 times x plus 2, right? And when you do that, remembering that this must pass through to all three. And so when I do the first one, this whole thing times this first fraction, the x's cancel, right? This x and this x cancel. And so it's essentially the a1 times these two factors. So I'm going to write that down. It's a1 times the 2x minus 1 times the x plus 2. Plus, now in the A2, this time, 
the 2x minus 1 factor cancels, so it'll be a2 with what next to it? x and then x plus 2, and then the last one will be a3 with what next to it? x times 2x minus 1. Good. Y'all are answering today. All right, and on the left side, the denominator cancels out, and all you're left with is the top. Now, this, this may look like a disaster, right? But the whole idea behind partial fractions is we're trying to figure out what A1, A2, and A3 are, right? I didn't mention this, but you could use, in a lot of books do use, instead of A1, A2, A3, they'll use like ABC instead. Capital A, capital B, capital C. The reason we use A1, A2, A3 instead is because when you think about this theoretically, this polynomial that factored on the bottom could have 40 factors, couldn't it? And if you have 40 factors and you want to use A, B, C, D, you only have 26 letters. So we use subscripts instead, subscripts you would never run out of, right? So that's why we do it. Um, all right, so what do we do here? You can multiply everything out, okay? You can multiply all this out, multiply all this out, multiply the, this out. That's what I'm going to call the long approach. And then you can use another approach, which is a shortcut. The shortcut just doesn't always work. Um, you'll see when the shortcut doesn't work. So let me show you, I guess, the long way first. And that way, that way always works. And then we'll look at the short way. So the long way. You actually multiply out the entire right side. And I'm going to give myself some room here. x squared plus 2x minus 1 equals, okay. So you, we multiply all this out, right? All this stuff, whatever. I didn't do that right, but you get the idea. What would those two together be? 2x squared plus 3x minus 2, right? But then you would have to distribute the a1 to everything. So what would that first thing look like? We have a 2, a1, x squared. How many x's did we have? Three of them, so I'll put 3, a1, x. And then the last thing we had was minus 2, but then we hit it with an, an a1, so minus 2a1. Make sense? Do the same exact thing on this. But this time it's a little easier because it's just x goes through. So we'll have plus what? A2x squared. Next one. Plus, I shouldn't have said y'all were answering. Plus 2a2x. We normally write it this way where you have, if you know the number, like it's 2, then just write 2. And then the next thing is a number which we don't know, and then the next thing is your variable. So that's kind of the standard way of writing everything out. So I've taken care of this part, and now here. Right? So what's this one going to become? 2A3X squared, and then minus A3X. And even though this looks really bad, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to collect like terms. So I'm going to go find all my x squared terms. And I'm going to put them all together. And once I get them all together, they all will have an x squared in them, right? So watch what I do. I'm going to factor out an x squared. Really, I'm just putting the coefficient of this one here, the coefficient of this one here, the coefficient of this one here, and then pulling an x squared out. Normally, we pull the x squared out in the front, but there's nothing wrong with pulling it out to the side in the back. You'll see why I did that in a minute. Then I do the same thing with all the x terms. Are there any questions on what I'm doing here? So this will become, in parentheses, 3a1. 
plus 2A2 minus A3 with an X on the outside. What if this had been a negative 3A1, like minus 3A1? I would have put a plus here still, and I just would have made that negative. All right? That's, always put pluses to separate things. And then in the parentheses, um, take care of the signs. Do I have any constants by themselves? Just negative 2A, right? So I'm going to throw that on the end, negative 2A. A1, sorry. Now... <clears throat> I'll highlight that green. So on the left side of the equation, I'm going to write out what we had, 1x squared plus 2x minus 1. Now, I put a 1 in front of the x squared for a reason here. Everything else is the same. The reason is that if we want the left side of the equation to match the right side, th and this, this yellow thing right here is an x, our x squared term, then whatever's in front of it, all this junk in the parentheses has to match up with what's in front over here. So that has to be equal to 1, doesn't it? And everything that's in the highlighted blue must match up with the coefficient on the x term over here. And then the number that's by itself, negative, 2A, a negative 2A1, must match up with the number that's by itself here, see? So I've got to match the yellows have to be equal, the blues have to be equal, and the greens have to be equal. So if I have three different pieces of information, right, the, the yellows have to match, the blues have to match, the greens have to match, three pieces of information, three equations, and I have three things I'm trying to solve for, A1, A2, A3, then I have now a system of equations. So I'm going to set up a system of linear, uh, system of linear equations that will look like this. We usually use a big brace to represent a system of equations. The first equation says that 2A1 plus A2 plus 2A3 must equal what? 1. The second system of equations says that 3A1 plus 2A2 minus, oops, minus A3 must equal what? 2. And the last thing says that negative 2A1 must equal what? negative 1. And notice I lined everything up, like my A1s are all in the same column, A2s and A3s. All right, now in a college algebra class, you'd probably do this by hand and it would take a little while, right, to do. Um, since most of you have calculators that are capable of doing this, I want to make sure you all know how to use your calculator to do this, to solve the system of equations. So you have an option here of doing it by hand or by doing it on your calculator. So if you have your calculator, now would be a good time. Anybody not have a calculator? So if, I mean, don't own one that you, you have one that you could bring? Do you know what kind it is? Yes, TI? Is it a TI? Yes? Anybody not have a TI? Everybody has a TI. Yes? Okay. All right. So this is going to work a little different for every student, all right, because even though all the TIs are pretty much the same, uh, there's little differences as the models got more and more advanced. So the method I'm going to show you right now to do this is a method that will work with all of the TIs. If you um, are already real good with your calculator and you know how to do this, I'm not trying to reteach you. Just do it the way you know how to do it. But this way is kind of universal, all right? So what you want to do is we're going to first convert this over to what we call an augmented matrix. So what we're going to do is we're going to write just the coefficients of everything we have here. This is called an augmented matrix. And Let's just remember what, what everything means here, right? The 2 is the coefficient on A1. The 1 is the coefficient on A2. The 2 is the coefficient on A3, right? What we're going to do is we're going to send this matrix into our calculator, and we're going to be using this function called RREF. 
And what it's going to do is it's going to spit out something like this, hopefully. And then it's going to have a number here, a number here, and a number here. That's what's going to happen. And what it, what's happening is it's transforming this matrix into this matrix. What does this first line really mean then? A1 and then nothing else, right, is equal to some number. And the second line means A2 is equal to some number, and this last line means A3 is equal to some number. So essentially the RREF function in the calculator solves for A1, A2, and A3. RREF stands for reduced row echelon form. For those of you who have to take linear algebra at any point in your life, reduced row echelon form is what this stands for. This is what a matrix looks like when it's in reduced row echelon form. All right, so how do we call up this routine? Well, somewhere in your calculator, there's a matrix menu. Okay, there's a matrix menu. So please try and find your matrix menu. If you have your calculator today, I want you to actually do this, all right? Find your matrix menu. And then I believe within that menu, there's a math menu. Yes? Is there a matrix in the math? Okay. Anyone not finding it that has their calculator in front of them? Now hold on, I see a couple of people with like cast like little TIs. Do you have do you have a higher TI or no? Is that it? That's it? That's it? That's it? Okay, do you think you have the ability to get your hands on one or no? I don't want you to go buy a $100 calculator. Do you know a friend or someone who has one? Maybe. Will you look into it? You need at least a TI-84 or 80. I don't know if the 83 will do it. Anyone have an 83? 83 plus? Okay, I think 83 plus and on will do it. Okay, see if you can. If you cannot, let me know, okay? I don't want anyone coming here on Thursday without it. I'll try and bring extras if I can, but I, I don't really have many. Many. Um, so go into this math menu and scroll down until you find, you should see RREF somewhere. Now there's another one, it's just REF, which is just row echelon form. This one's a little more, it's reduced row echelon form. So go ahead and get to that. And then once you get that, select it by hitting enter. And what it's going to do is it's going to take you back to your home screen, and you should be looking at RREF with a parenthesis sitting there waiting for you to input something. Anybody, anybody that has a TI not with me? Okay, so here's the way we're going to put this matrix in. Remember, this is what we're going to try and put into the calculator, this right here, right? So we have one, two, three rows, don't we? So here's the way it works. The first thing you do is you put in a bracket, not a parenthesis, not a brace, a bracket. The bracket tells the TI that you're going to start the matrix. The next thing you do is insert another bracket, and this tells the TI you're going to start the first row. And now you're going to put the numbers that are in your first row, put them in with commas between them. So we would have here, what, 2121? Two, yes? Cross this first row, 2121? And look, remember what I said a minute ago. I realize there are other ways to do this. You can insert a matrix a lot easier than this, but this works for all the TIs, so that's why I'm showing you this way. I closed it with the bracket. What does this mean? And first row. What do you think we want to do now? Start another bracket. That's going to start the second row, right? And now you put in the numbers. What are the numbers? Someone read them out for me. 
3, 2, negative 1, 2. Then what? Negative 2 at the end? It's 2. 3, 2, negative 1, 2. What now? Close bracket. Then open bracket. I'm running out of space. So I'm going to do it down here. Open bracket now. Last row. Negative 2, comma, 0, comma, 0, comma, negative 1. Now what? Close bracket. That ends the third row. Now what? Close bracket again. What does that do? Ends the matrix. Then close parenthesis. What does that do? Closes the function RREF. That is the correct syntax user input to make the calculator spit out the answer. So hit enter now. And you should have something, some way, again, this is going to depend on how fancy your calculator is. Some of them just actually show you the entire matrix. Some of them use the same format as this for the answer. So it will have like double bracket, then it will say 100 zero, zero something, and then 010 zero, zero something. What do we have? Do we have 100 zero, zero something? 100 zero, zero what? 0.5? Zero one zero point two uh, zero zero one negative point one. We anyone agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now we're not going to use decimals. This is calculus too. It, I mean, if it's if it's a decimal, we can't tell what it is. Then sure. So one half is point five, right? Zero one zero point two is one fifth, and Zero, zero, 001 and then negative 0 0.1 is one tenth. Okay? This is this is a one, that's a two, that's a three. These are your answers. Yes. It's above the seven? Where is it? It's above the seven? Do you see it? Just write the button above the seven. Is it there? It's right there. I know. Sometimes it's right the obvious thing right under your nose, right? I was going to suggest you return that if it didn't have the comma. All right. All of this, right, everything we've done here so far, and, and trust me, this, this work that the calculator just did for you saved you about 15 minutes easily. Well, maybe not. This one wouldn't have been that bad. But all of this was just so we could come back and say that this original integrand, right, is really this. Yes? So now we're done with the partial fraction decomposition. We will re revisit the integral. So let's go back. Now the integral, let me end that, go back to the integral. This integral now becomes... A1 over X, wasn't it? What's A1? 1 half over X plus A2, which for us was 1 fifth, over, what was the second one? You have to make sure you do it exactly the way you had it written out. 2X minus 1 was our next one. Okay, plus 1, t no, minus 1 tenth. I'm going to do it this way. I'm put the negative 1 tenth on top. And then the last factor was x plus 2? Okay. I'm going to go a little slower than I normally would here. We are now going to be able to break this into, split this into three separate integrals. Each one of them, we can pull the constant that we just found out, and then just handle each of these with some pretty basic integration. So what's the antiderivative of 1 over x? Natural log of absolute value of x. Plus now this next one, what's the antiderivative of 1 over 2x minus 1? one half natural log of 2x minus 1, because remember you have to scale by the a, but then you had out here already a one fifth. So the one fifth and the one half come together and make a one tenth. 
natural log 2x plus 1, or minus 1. What about the next one? Do we have to scale by anything here? Nope. So it's just natural log of x plus 2, and then the negative 1 tenth outside. Plus C. We're done. It only took like half an hour. All right, now let's do the same problem, but I'm gonna do it a shorter way. I recommend you do the shorter way um, anytime you can. The, the problem, like I said, is you can't always do it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here. I'm going to grab this problem again. See if I can do this. Everything is the same all the way until you get down to here. So I'm just going to copy this real quick. All right, so everything would be the same. You have to figure it out, multiply it by the LCD, and you get to this point. And this is where we, we distributed everything through, right? Then match things up, made our matrix. The short way, with the little asterisk next to it, right? Why is this uh, little asterisk there, star, whatever? Doesn't always work, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out what these are without having to actually multiply it out. So let's focus first on trying to figure out what A1 is. To figure out what A1 is, what I need to do is I need to kill all of this junk out here off. Kill it. Make it go away. And that would make it much easier, wouldn't it? Is there something that you could do? Is there an X value that you could plug in that would make this whole term and this whole term go away? If X was what? Zero. Do you all see that? If I plug zero in here, it kills this one off. Zero kills this one off. Zero does not kill this one off because these two factors don't go to zero. And then I have to plug zero in on this side. So let's just see what happens if I let X be zero. My entire equation turns into what's the left side? Zero, zero, and just negative one, right? Negative 1 equals A1. What is 2 times 0? Take away 1. Negative 1. And then what's uh, 0 plus 2? Two. 2. That's multiplication there. And then we know that these all went away, right? Everything here is gone. Well, that's just saying that negative 1 equals negative 2A1, right? And you can divide both sides by negative 2 and get what? 1 half. Well, that was easy, right? That matches what we had before, right, from the matrix? Yeah. So this way is really, really convenient. Now what we would do is we would do the same process, but now let's see, is there a way that you could get A2? So this time, you, you don't want this one to go away. So you need to be able to kill this one and this one. So what can you do? Is there a factor that's in this one and this one that's not in this one? The 2x minus 1, right? So how, what x do you plug in here to make this whole thing 0? Just 1 half, right? Just set it equal to 0 real quick. Solve it. You get, you get 1 half, right? So if I replace x with 1 half here, x with 1 half here, those will both, these two on the outside will go to 0. But I have to do it for the whole damn thing. All right, so go again. Let x be equal to 1 half. 
All right, let's look at this left side. What's one half squared? One fourth. What's two times a half? One minus one? Zero. So you just get one fourth on the left side equals this whole thing we know is already going to go away. Then we have plus A2 times, let's see, we're replacing this X with one half, so one half. And then replace this X with one half. What's one half plus two? Five halves. And then what about the last one here? It's gone, right? And now we have a nice little linear equation here in A2. So one-fourth equals, uh, what's that, five-fourths, A2. And then multiply both sides by four-fifths, and you get one-fifth is A2. And does that match what we had? Yes? And then finally, to get A3, we need to kill these two off. So what do you plug in? Negative 2. So let x be negative 2. And if you do that, I'm not going to go through the work. A3 should come out to be 1 tenth. Make sense? And then you go and you know plug everything back in, and you're done. So this is very, very nice when it works. And it works a lot of the times. Is it negative 1 tenth? Thank you. All right, are there any questions on that? Let's look, take a look at this next one. If you have Microsoft OneNote on your computer, it's Windows S, the Windows key and S, if you're using a PC, like Windows S will bring up a screen clipper. And then you can set it to either go to your clipboard or save as file or something like that. I don't remember. All right, here we go. So you go through. It's not integration by parts. It's not trig sub. It's not all that. But it's a rational function. First step, look at the degree. Numerator, denominator, right? Four is bigger than three. If it's bigger or equal, we use long division, right? Bigger or equal, don't mess that up. If those were both threes or both fours, you'd still have to do long division. So I'm going to do my long division over here. X to the fourth space, because I don't, well, you can actually put a 0x cubed. Minus 2x squared plus 4x plus 1. And on the outside, x cubed minus x squared minus x plus 1. Just remember that space to make sure you line things up correctly. All right, what do you uh, multiply x cubed by to get x to the fourth? x. And then you go ahead and, and multiply this x times every term here, put them underneath, and you're going to subtract or change the signs. So we have x to the fourth minus x cubed minus x squared plus x, come through and subtract. So change the signs of what was here. And then just add down. What's left when I, when I do this? What's down there? x cubed. Is it? Plus x squared. We should just have minus x squared because it was negative 2x squared plus x squared. And then how many x's? Three x's. Just remember, change your signs, right? And then bring your 1 down. We okay? Yes? Okay. And now you repeat the process. You say, what do I multiply x cubed by to get x cubed? 1. 
we don't stop yet, right? We stop when the power here gets smaller than here. So one, put plus one up here. And now multiply. So x cubed minus x squared minus x plus one. Come through and change the signs. Minus here, plus there, plus there, and this one becomes a minus. So I exaggerate these real... Uh, well, I try and be as clear as possible that the signs have changed so I don't mess up. And then I add down. So what happens when you add down? These are gone. These are gone, right? This is 4x, and that's it. Just 4x. And now I have to stop because x cubed doesn't go into 4x, so this is my remainder. So I put up, put up here plus my remainder over my divisor. My divisor was x cubed minus x squared minus x plus 1. Did I forget to put the integrals on these? Oh, no, no, they're down here. I copied the wrong thing. I meant to copy this one. I apologize. I'll, I'll copy it and put it back up there. Because it was an integral we were doing, right? Okay, so what we're saying is that this integrand can be replaced with this expression. And it's actually not that bad of a thing because we can integrate the first two easily. The last one, though, we have to work on. And it's, it's still a rational function. It's not the same as this one. But now the power on top is smaller than the bottom, so we'll go to the next step, which is to factor everything. So let's, uh, let's write what we have so far. Do we agree that this is equal to 1 half x squared plus x plus this new integral? Right? This 1 half x squared and the x comes from just taking the antiderivative of those two. I just didn't feel like rewriting the whole integral with this in it. We clear? All right, now we're going to go do some work. And remember, we have to come back to this, right, and plug in our answer. We've got to go figure out what this is. So I'm going to do that down here. I want to know what the integral 4x over x cubed minus x squared minus x plus 1 dx is. If I can figure that out, then I'll be done. So I'm going to try and factor the denominator. How does the denominator factor? Or does it? How many terms do you have? Four, one, two, three, four, right? Well, whenever we have four terms, we try grouping. Grouping doesn't always work, but that's what we first initially try. So remember how to do grouping? Yes? You look at the first two terms, what's the same in both? X squared, pull that out, you'll be left with x minus one. In the second two terms, you want to try and factor something else, something out of these that will leave you with an x minus 1. So what can I factor out of these two? Negative 1. So I pull negative 1 out, and I'm left with x minus 1. Since the x minus 1s match, I can factor an x minus 1 out and be left with the coefficients that were in front, x squared and minus 1. And then I look at this and recognize also what? Difference of squares. So this is actually x minus 1 times x plus 1 times x minus 1, which is really x minus, or I'll say x plus 1 times x minus 1 squared. 
this was grouping. That's college algebra. That's a long time ago. Questions up to this point? So that means my denominator can be rewritten as x plus 1 times x minus 1 squared dx. <clears throat> Let's go back and look at the notes on the strategy on how to do these. And let's see what we do in this case. The first case was that we had n distinct linear factors. Do we have, do we have n distinct linear factors? Well, x plus 1, right, is a linear factor. x minus 1 is a linear factor. The problem is x minus 1 is not just x minus 1 by itself. It is repeated, isn't it? It's two x minus 1s multiplied. So this is not n distinct linear factors. This is maybe the next thing, which is the denominator has some repeated linear factors. So what happens when you have a repeated linear factor? So anytime you see a repeated linear factor, like we have x minus 1 squared, what we have to do is rewrite it with a number over the linear factor, then the number over the linear factor squared, then the number over the linear factor cubed, all the way till we get up to the, whatever that power was. And our power that we just had was what? Two, so I only have to have two of these. So notice it's the linear factor, no pow well, power of one, and then power of two, and it just keeps coming up. We have to do that for every repeated linear factor. But in addition to that, we also had a distinct linear factor up here, so we have to account for that one also. So let's just see how this is going to play out. So I'm going to start my partial fractions. I'm going to start on the next page. Partial fraction decomposition. So we have 4x over x plus 1 times x minus 1 squared equals, all right, let me start with the x plus 1. Because it's x plus 1 and it's a distinct linear factor, I'm going to say I need a1 over that. And that's it. That's all I need for the x plus 1. But because x minus 1 is squared, I'm going to need to add to this another constant, I'll call it a2, over the x minus 1 then another constant, a3, over the x minus 1, but this time squared. And I keep coming up with powers, right? If this were a third power, I'd come up, and I have an a4 with x minus 1 cubed, but I stop as soon as I get to the highest power I see here, which in this case is 2. Understand? Good. Now, same thing we did last time, multiply by the LCD on both sides. So what's your LCD? Everything down here, right, on the left side? Multiply everything you see there on the left, on the right. We know that on the left they go away, which leaves us with 4x equals. Now, what about on the right side? What happens when you distribute this one through to here? a1 times x minus 1 squared. Just the x plus 1 goes away. Plus, what about on that a2 one? An x minus 1 cancels with one of the factors here, but not both of them. So you'll still have the x plus 1. You'll still have one factor of x minus 1. So it'll be x plus 1 times x minus 1. And then plus a3 and when we do this to this, the only thing left would be what? x plus 1. There we go. Let's try the short way. All right? Let's try and see if we can do this. Short. Let's try and get a1. How are you going to get a1? Kill both of these, right? 
X is what? Negative 1. Let X be negative 1. In that case, the left side becomes negative 4. The right side is just A1. Be careful here. Negative 1 minus 1 squared. Right, I'm replacing that X with negative 1. Negative 1 minus 1 is not 0. It's negative, one, negative 2. And then I square it, right? So what happens when you uh, square negative 2? You get 4. So 4A1 equals negative 4. So A1 is what? Negative 1. All right. Feeling good. Now let's try and get A2. Can we get A2? We have to kill this one and this one off. Can't do it. Can't do it at the same time. See, if I say, look, to kill this off, I have to let x be 1, right? But that won't kill this off. And if I let x be 1, what's it going to do to this? Kill off a2. So there's not an easy way to get a2 right now, is there? But maybe we can get a3. Can we get a3? A3, we uh, let x be what? 1. So let's let x be 1. And you get, what, on the left side, 4 equals, we know this is dead, we know this is dead, and we plugged 1 in right here, 1 plus 1 is 2, so equals 2A3, so A3 is 2, isn't it? Now what? We have 2 of 3, don't we? How do we get the third one? What's that? You could plug those numbers in, couldn't you? I mean, you could plug in 2 for A3, and you could plug in negative 1 for A1. But here's something I hadn't really tried before. I wonder if this will work. I mean, we were letting X be negative 1 and let X be 1, and we were able to isolate and get the things we wanted, right? But why don't we just try and let X be something, something else? Like, how about zero? What would happen? I don't think I've ever approached it this way. But in thinking about it here, this should work. If X is zero, what does the left side of the equation become? Zero. What does the right side of the equation become? So let's take our time. Be careful here. What is A1? Do we know it? Negative one. So that's negative one. Now, do we, if we're plugging in zero for X, what does this become? One. So negative one squared is one. And then plus, do we know what A2 is? No, but that's what we're trying to solve for. What happens when I plug in zero here and zero here? You get, what, one times negative one. What's one times negative one? Negative one, so I have negative one multiplied there. And then plus, what's A3? Two, and then times one. So you get zero equals negative one minus A2 plus two. A is, A2 is what? One. Hey, that worked. Nice. Questions? I'm done with partial fractions. So back to that integral. That integral, not the original integral, just the integral that we had not figured out yet, right? Now breaks down to be three pieces. They are a1 over, what was it, x plus 1? Negative 1 over x plus 1. Then a2, which is, we just found to be 1, over x minus 1. And then plus a3, which is 2, over the x minus 1 squared.
And what I'm claiming now is that each one of these is, is done with relative ease. This one right here, what's the antiderivative of negative 1 over x plus 1? Bring the negative out, right? Natural log of x plus 1. Next one. Natural log of x minus 1. All right. This one maybe not as clear, so this one is not a natural log, is it? No, because you have squared. However, we did this last class. Remember, I said there was a bunch that we should know how to do. This was, we did number three and number four. We had a constant over repeated linear factor. So this was a basic U substitution. So if you wanted to go through all the work, you would write, rewrite U as the X minus one, DU is DX, that integral would become integral uh, 1 over u squared du, which is integral u to the negative 2 du. I'm doing that quickly because we already did this last class and a long time ago, too. So what is the antiderivative of u to the negative 2? Negative 1 over u. So this will become negative 2 over x minus 1, and then everything else out here. Plus a constant. Do we box this as our final answer? No, because we had those two pieces from the very beginning. 1 half x squared, what was it, plus x? Okay, so... Our final answer is one half x squared plus x minus natural log x plus one plus natural log x minus one minus two over I already forgot x minus one plus c. That one didn't take as long as the previous one because I didn't go the long way. I showed you the short way. What do you all think? Go look. So I'm, I'm going back and I'm looking again at last semester's test. Their first one, this was just a power rule problem where you split it up into a bunch of different powers of x and then do the antiderivative. So there's no real technique there. This one was a basic u substitution. I think I gave that to you as a quiz, didn't I? Did I give that to you all as a quiz? I did. This one was another basic substitution that wasn't very natural, I believe. You use, use um, 2 plus x. This one was a trig substitution. You had to rewrite this as a square root cubed. Partial fraction. This could be partial fractions, but look, it's a linear expression over quadratic. This is that one where you, where you look at the denominator is u, right? The derivative of the denominator was what? Is what? 2x plus 3. You try and make that look like 2x plus 3. That's where you massaged it and moved things around. So this one does not require the partial fraction decomposition, all right? It, it, it actually, you would have trouble doing it. We should actually look at this problem in a minute. Because I remember when I gave this on a test, students tried to do partial fraction decomposition, 
and it was a disaster, a disaster. They wasted like 40 minutes on it because it, it wouldn't go that way, all right? This one, what's your instinct tell you? Integration by parts. What does this one tell you? What's that? Just the basic U sub. This one again got them also. The last problem test, they were expecting it to be the hardest. If you just take this, the, the, what's under the root, the derivative of this is exactly that. So this is just 1 over root U, du. So that's U to the negative 1 half. I'm not saying you're going to be given something like that. I'm just trying to give you a perspective of what they got. Okay, so you can see that there was at least one partial fraction problem in the test. You should expect the same. Um, um, eight's, a, eight's a pretty good number. I mean, you are going to have an hour 40 minutes for the test. Remember, it's not going to be the whole class. You're going to have an hour 40 minutes. If you f finish early, you're going to go in the hallway and do whatever, and we come back and we continue lecturing. So eight problems seems about right. Remind me to come back to that problem. I want to look at it. Whoa. Where am I? I'm in the wrong semester. Hold on. All right. Let's look at this next one here. This one. Do I need to do long division? No. Is it a basic substitution? No. Derivative of this, 3x squared plus 4. I don't quite have that up here. And that whole massaging thing gets a little more complicated when you have cubic and quadratic on top. When it's quadratic on bottom and linear on top, the massaging part is a lot easier to do. This one becomes a little more challenging. So let's see, let's see if we can just go through the partial fraction, uh, not partial fractions, the um, yeah, partial fractions. We are going to first try and factor out the top and bottom, if it factors. I know the bottom factors to be x times x squared plus 4, right? Does the top factor? Doesn't look like it. It doesn't. So we haven't had this before, all right? We have two, yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Good question. And you know what? Since you're thinking that way, let me, let me go to something here. The only way that this up here is going to factor and cancel is if, one, x could be pulled out, which you know x can't be pulled out of this, right? And the only other way would be if x squared plus 4 could somehow be factored out of this, but there's, there's no way that that would work. So you kind of know right away nothing's going to cancel, but that's why you would do it, just in case. That's where you would have a hole in the graph of the function. But. Um, all right, so looking back at this, what do you do, case B, we, have, we had repeated linear factor. We took care of that just a second ago. How about an irreducible quadratic factor? That means you have a quadratic down here that you can't factor down. X squared plus 4 is an irreducible quadratic. That can't be factored any further, can it? Right? Not over real numbers. You can factor that with imaginary numbers, but not with real numbers. So we're kind of stuck. That's an irreducible quadratic factor. What is this? A linear factor. So we have a linear factor, and we have an irreducible quadratic factor. 
So what do we do in the event that we have an irreducible quadratic factor? Let's see. For every irreducible quadratic factor, all right, for every irreducible quadratic factor, we are going to rewrite the irreducible quadratic factor, but instead of putting just a number on top, what are we going to put on top? A linear expression. Okay, let's see this in action. Here comes my partial fractions. 2x squared minus x plus 4 over x, x squared plus 4. This is equal to partial fraction decomposition. Um, take care of that linear factor first, the x. So how about just a1 over x? We good? Plus, now for the irreducible quadratic factor, I'm going to put another constant, a2x, plus another constant, a3. I could use ab or, you know, bc or something like this, but I'm using a1, a2, a3 to represent all my constants, so let's just stick with that. Over what? My irreducible quadratic factor. Okay. Questions? Irreducible quadratic factor, you put a linear expression on top. Why do we want it to turn out to be quadratic on bottom, linear on top? Well, because last class we said we could deal with irreducible quadratics on the bottom and linear on top. We said we could handle that, and that's why it's going to work. The question is, can we actually <laughs> rewrite it this way? So what do we do next? Both sides by the LCD, x, x squared plus 4 here, x, x squared plus 4 here. Distribute through 2x squared minus x plus 4 equals what happens on this first multiplication. Just the x cancels. You're left with a1x squared plus 4. On the next one, what happens? x squared plus 4 cancels. You still have the x there, don't you, though? And notice that when this x squared plus 4 cancels, you have an x here, but you, have, you actually have a linear expression up here. So that linear expression has to be multiplied by x, so just distribute the x through to both. So how about this? A, well, you know, I'll distribute it on the next step. Leave it out there for now. Does anybody see something here that's that's different than what we've had before? You notice something that we have that's kind of an issue? Yeah, these two are together, right? And you're going to have it, it will be impossible for you to ever kill a to kill off the a1, right? You can never kill off the a1 because there's no way you can ever make this zero. It's not going to happen. In addition to that, if I try, if I distribute this x through, and I try and get a2, since I can't kill off a1, I'm going to have to try and kill off a3. I just, there's just no way. It's going to become more difficult to try and do it the short way, in other words. So let's just do the long way. It's not going to take that long, actually, because it multiplies out pretty clean. So what do you get here? A1 x squared plus 4A1 whoa, plus A2 x squared plus A3 x, yes? Which equals, put your x squareds together. What do you have? A1 plus A2, X squared. Put your X's together. There's only one of them, right?
and then any any constants by themselves together. That's a constant. That must equal the left side. System of equations. What does the yellow tell us? A1 plus A2 equals 2. What does the blue tell us? A3 equals negative 1. What does the pink tell us? A1 equals, well, sorry, 4A1. Yeah, A1 is 1. Is that okay if I just divide by 4? So 4A1 must equal 4. That means 4A1 must equal 4. Divide both sides by 4. You get A1 is 1. We have everything here, right? I don't even need a calculator for this. I know what A1 is right now, don't I? A1 is 1. Now go into this equation, the first one. If A1 is 1, then what's A2? That implies A2 is 1. If I know what, and I already know what A3 is, right? Negative 1? So that one we got, we did have to multiply everything out, but we didn't necessarily need a calculator to do the solving. Questions? Comments, concerns, complaints. You ready for the original integral to be rewritten now? Integral. We broke it up into two pieces. Right? It was A1 over X. So 1 over X. Plus a2x plus a3. So what is that going to become? x minus 1 over x squared plus 4. We good? Can you handle this one? Yes. Natural log x. How about this one? Linear over quadratic, right? Irreducible, though. Okay, yeah, so that's what I was going to ask you. Do you want to do it this way? Do you want to say, okay, this is going to be my u. What's the derivative of this? 2x, so I need to make this look like a 2x. You could do that. But also notice this, because there's no x term in here, right? Doesn't this x squared plus 4, like if this up here was just a number, like let's say 1, wouldn't 1 over x squared plus 4 be, uh, we take the antiderivative arct arctan or something like that, right? If it was a number up there? So I'm wondering how obvious this is to you to just split that integral up into two integrals. You can do it because you have um, two terms on top, and you can look at the, in, the entire bottom like this. Isn't that the same? I took the antiderivative 1 over x in natural log, and then just wrote the x over this, and then wrote the negative 1 over this, but then pulled the negative 1 out. See, that way, this one you're going to do with your basic u substitution. u is x squared plus 4. Derivative of that's 2x. You're off by 2. That's fine. This one, arc 10. You're there. So I'm just going to write down what the, what the answer should be here. I'm not going to go through those because those are pretty basic. Um, plus 1 half natural log x squared plus 4. 
I'll put underneath what I did for this integral. I did u is equal to x squared plus 4. Basic u sub on this one. This one, straight to the formula. Remember in the formula, um, we had x squared plus a squared. So a for us would be what here? 2. So in the formula, it's actually minus, because there's minus. What was it? 1 over a arctan of x over a? 1 over a arctan of x over a plus c. Was that formula 17? Okay, so that from, from here to here, that's formula number 17. Here to here, basic U substitution. Last. Okay, I know we've got, let me go another 15 minutes. Let me do this last problem. We'll take our break, okay? For some reason, by looking at you all, it seems like this stuff isn't getting you very excited. It's having the reverse effect. It's kind of putting you to sleep. I don't know. That depends on you, I guess. What would be our first step here? Check the powers. They're the same. Yeah? So... Long divide, you want to do long division? Okay. You do long division. While you're doing long division, I'm going to try something else. So long division will work, okay? It'll work. But what I did here is I looked and I said, damn, these are really, really close to each other, aren't they? So I just wrote down what I, the bottom is right here. And then I tweaked it with these two to make it match what's up here, right? So if I take negative 4x and I add x, I get negative 3x. And if I took uh, 3 and I took away 1, I'd get 2. So this is the same expression up here, isn't it? And if I just split right here and do... All of this over this, I get what? One. And then if I do these two over this, I get probably what you got if you did long division. Either way, you need to be able to get from there to here, right? Now, what about this? The linear over quadratic, right? Linear over quadratic. You, you do, this is where you could run into an issue. Let me, let me actually go one more step. Let me take the antiderivative of one because it's in my way. Was that question? Three minus one is two. Negative four x plus x is negative three x. 
I wrote down what I wanted first, and then I kind of thought about how do I make a negative 4x turn into a negative 3x? I need to add x. How do I turn a 3 into a 2? I need to subtract 1. They don't always work like that, but sometimes they do. Okay, linear over quadratic. I think this is very similar to what I was just showing you um, that I gave on that test, and a bunch of students tried to do partial fractions on and wasted a bunch of time. So we could go through the process right now of trying to factor the bottom. Does it factor? Anyone try it yet? Does this factor? May or may not. I don't think it does. Let's see, 12 and then negative 4, positive 12, negative 4. I don't think so. It doesn't factor. But this one you could use what we did in class last time. I, I make a substitution. u is equal to 4x squared minus 4x plus 3, right? du is what? What's du? 8x minus 4 dx. Can you turn this? into 8x minus 4. Yes, how are we going to do it? So I'm doing just this right now, okay? Turn that into it. So what do you start with? One-eighth, right? So you start with the coefficient on x. You need it to be an 8, so we start there. I do one-eighth on the outside. Then I distribute an 8 through the top, through the whole thing. So 8x minus 8 over 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. Be really careful there. That 8 that you come in with, 8 over 8, that 8 that goes through top must go through both, right? If it's only on the x, then you did not distribute it through correctly. Now it's looking closer, right? I need this, this not to be a minus 8. I need it to be a minus 4. So this is where I said... Just come in here with that hidden zero, right? I want to subtract a 4 and add a 4. What was, what was already there? It was minus 8. Where do I split this now? Because this is going to become two integrals. Where do I split it? Yeah, right after the minus 4 there. So this is going to turn into two new integrals. It's going to be the 1 8 out front integral 8x minus 4 over the denominator. Plus 1 8, and now what was the, what were these two together? negative 4 over the 4x squared minus 4x plus 3 dx. I'm going to pull negative 4 out and make that a 1. That would have been a negative 1 half, right? What is the antiderivative of this first integral? By design, that's, this is 1 over u, isn't it? 1 over u du. So what's the antiderivative of 1 over u? Natural log. So we get 1 eighth natural log 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. And then over here, minus 1 half integral 1 over 4x squared minus 4x plus 3 dx. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a break right now. It's 1035. Um, you have a 10-minute break, which is going to take you to 1045. And then you have 10 minutes after that to solve this problem and turn it into me, just this integral. So at 10.55, I want you to turn this integral in on that table, and you can help each other out. Understand?
I've placed the homework assignment for partial fractions up here. Uh, anybody else quiz or quiz assignment? So how did that one work out? What did you have to do? Complete the square, right? Okay. Complete the square. When you complete the square, you had to do what though first? To, before you can complete the square, you actually have to have a leading coefficient on the x term here of a 1. So you have to pull a 4 from everything first. And then you go about doing the completing of the square. We did that problem? Exactly. Yeah. So I want to see if you remembered what to do. Because look, I mean, this is just an intermediate step now, isn't it? I mean, this is just part of a larger problem. Okay, so uh, let's say that everything that we've done up to there for sure is going to be on the test. All right, so and now we're going to start something new. And after I'm done, I'll ask you whether or not you want that to be on the test or not. I know you want to, you already say no right now, but just Give it a minute, maybe maybe you'll change your mind. No. All right, we are going to step away now from what we've been doing, which is just, here's an integral, evaluate the integral, use a technique, right? And we practice, I mean, we did all these different techniques and we realized they can get pretty involved. Now it's time to figure out like, what is this for? Like, what are we doing this for? Yes, I think so. You can let me know if it's not. Um, if it's not, just send me an email, I'll, pu I'll put it out there. So this is not a section out of the book. Um, it's a couple of sections that I've put together all into one section, which I'm calling Chapter R, and it's going to stand for Riemann Sums. So please kind of like clear your brain f from all the techniques for a minute and just kind of step back and, and, and have an open mind about what we're about to do, all right? And then we'll tie it to the, the integral in a minute. So the motivation of the whole thing comes from the area problem. And what is the formula for the area of, of a circle? So if you're given a circle, you know it's radius, area, pi r squared, right? Where did it come from? Where did pi r squared come from? Just magically appeared, right? So we're gonna, have, we're gonna try and figure out where it actually came from. Um, without the formula, how could you estimate this area? So if, if someone draws a circle, and let's say you have a ruler. I know, thought there was one in here. Say you had some measuring device. How could you estimate the area? OK, so you could, you could do something like draw a square inside of it, right? And that wouldn't be enough, right? But that would be easy to find the area of a square. So you could do that, and then maybe you could draw another rectangle in here, and then maybe draw another one in here, and keep drawing rectangles. 
more and more rectangles, and then all these little gaps come in here and try and fill them in with little rectangles, right? As many as you could possibly do, right? The more you do, the more accurate you'll be, yes? But no matter what you do, if you take these, these rectangles and squares and you add up, right, sum all of the areas, then you're going to get a number, aren't you? And that area, I'm going to put area AI, I meaning inside. So I'm taking squares and rectangles inside the circle. That would be less than the area, I'll put true down here, true, which is its true area, yes? Then you could repeat the process. This time, instead of taking squares and rectangles inside the circle, you could take a square outside the circle. You could find that area, yes? That'd be too much, though. That'd be more than the circle. So then you could, from that, start subtracting little rectangles and things in here, couldn't you? So if you take the big square and subtract the sum of these little squares, you would get another area. And that area would be the outside, right? The outer areas. And that would be bigger than the true one. Let's say in. Understand? The more rectangles you do, the better your, your instrument of measuring, the more precise it is, the better your estimation becomes. And what you do is you try and squeeze the true area in between, in between two values. And these are going to get closer and closer to each other, right? And you get almost like this kind of squeeze theorem thing happening, two numbers that are both going to the same place. And that's, that's how you could do it, right? Without a formula pi r squared. And even though this looks like, well, I mean, why would you ever do that? This is the way it was done for a long time. That's I mean, when they were trying to estimate areas. Now, you could look at it a different way, and instead of doing rectangles, you could do triangles, because areas of triangles are easy to find, aren't they? One half base times high. So I could do triangles. By the way, this circle right here, I believe, has a radius of, of one. Um, I believe. So I could do smaller triangles, right? And add all those up. And if I zoom in, let me try and zoom in here. You see we have error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, error, right? The mistake is that we didn't account for that little sliver of, of yellow. But that's because we're using triangles. Uh, smaller they are, I mean, bigger the triangles are, the more error we have, right? As we let the number of triangles become larger, our error starts to vanish, doesn't it? Never truly goes away, but it begins to get less and less and less. So imagine, though, that you could let these triangles get so small, infinitesimally small, that they just turn into just single, like, rays, you know, like, not array, line segments. What's the problem with trying to find the area of a line? It's, it's a line. It's one-dimensional, right? Or two-dimensional. It, it, sorry. has one-dimensional. You don't have a second dimension for width if it's just a line. So it's impossible to find the area of a line. So you can't really ever turn these into lines. But the idea is that you let them get smaller and smaller and approach a line without actually getting there. And that's where the whole limit from Cal 1 allows us to let something either become infinitely big or infinitely small without actually ever getting there. So there looks like there may be a way to attack this problem using a limit. Don't quite remember why I put this in here. I'm like, what the hell is that in there? All right, so just remember this formula for the area of a triangle. Area of a triangle is one half base times height. But if you know two sides of the triangle and you know the angle between them, the formula becomes area is one half AB sine theta. That's a pre-cal formula. All right, um, did I say what this is called yet? I didn't. Ah, there it is. 
divide and conquer. You split up the area into a bunch of little pieces, you add them up. This is actually called the method of exhaustion. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, could you actually sit there and you know, measure all these little things out? It would you'd be there forever. And I believe it was the Chinese that were the first to get a really good, good estimate of pi um, getting the area of a circle, and they were using method of exhaustion to try and get that. All right, so now, with all that in mind, okay, with all of that in mind, let's just talk a little bit about distances. Let's say a person walks at a constant speed of two miles per hour, right? How far have they gone in three hours? Six miles, right? Well, let's look at it graphically. If on one axis we have time, and on the other axis we have their speed, then the speed is constant at two. So it's a constant function. If we mark the hours one, two, three, then what, how is the answer here, total of six miles connected to this picture? It's the area below it, right? If we take this, new page here, and we look at the area below this, right, the area of that, is three times two, which is six. So if you're given a speed, which is a function, in this case constant, and you're given it on an interval, zero to three here, you find the area below that, that six would represent the total distance traveled, wouldn't it? Okay. Now, how about this person? How far does this person go between two and five hours? So look, th this is a different problem because the speed is not constant, is it? This is speed, this is time. So they're not walking at constant speed. Their speed changes as time goes on. They're getting faster as they go. But the speed would represent, uh, the total distance would still be represented by the same geometric figure. It would be between two and five hours. It would be this total area. Could you figure out what that was from this picture? Yeah? What's this area right here? What's the area of this? It'd be the height is one. How wide is it? Three. Three units wide. Yes? One unit high, so the area here would be three. What about the area of this triangle? So what's its height? appear to be what's this height two and the width we or the length we already knew was what three so area of that is one half length one half base times height which would be three again this times this half at six so this would be three so the area total area here would be what six so how far did they go six miles so as long as you can find the area below the, the speed function, you can find the total distance they traveled. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me close this one. Okay, how far does this person go between the hours zero and three? Get off of there. Okay, between zero and three, how far does this person go? So notice that the speed function here in red is not straight, right? We don't have a triangle anymore, it's curved, it's the function x squared. So how are you gonna find these areas if it's not a rectangle and it's not a triangle. How do you do it? Right? Understand the dilemma? As soon as the function becomes something interesting, our little method fails of just getting rectangle and triangle. All right, so this is where we're stuck. So what we'll do is we'll do an approximation using rectangles. So we need an efficient way of determining the areas of functions. We, we use areas of rectangles to do it. 
So look, if we want to know the area underneath this blue curve, what I could do, and, and please pay attention to, to um, what's happening here, I am taking, let me take it so I can write on it real quick. What I'm doing is I'm taking some points here. Um, I'll call this X0, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. These are the X values right here. And for my first rectangle, what I'm doing is I'm plugging in this X1. I'm going up to the function. So how high is this? How high is this off the ground? Isn't it the function's value at X1? Isn't it? That's how tall it is? And then that's the height, and then the width of it is whatever the distance between these two is, yes? So it would be X1 take away X0. That would give you R1, wouldn't it? What about R2? What would R2 be? F of X2 times how wide is it? X2 minus X1. Understand? This is called taking right endpoints because I'm, I'm actually creating a rectangle. I'm going up and then back over to the left. You could do it the other way. You could pick a left endpoint and go to the right, but this, this is called using right endpoints. And if I take these and I figure out, you know, what R1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5 are, if I add up those areas, I'm going to have an approximation. Approximation, not the exact area. The more rectangles we have, the better the approximation. Uh, we will need a way to add up many rectangles, right? If we're going to try and get a good approximation, we have to be able to add them up. The more rectangles we have, oops, that's repeating itself. So here's, here's an example. Here's a blue curve, and I'm going to try and find the area underneath it. Now, the true area, just so we know, is 41.33, 333 repeating. That's the true area between 1 and 5, this area underneath, is 41.33. Right now I'm estimating it with this big gray rectangle. How wide is this rectangle? 4, and how tall is it? 25. 4 times 25, 100. My estimate is 100, and it sucks, right? I'm not even close. So what I need to do is maybe add a couple of more rectangles or do something that's going to make my computer freak out. There we go. So how about two rectangles? So now what I've done is I've taken the interval 1 to 5, which we said was what, 4 units wide? I've cut it in half, and then I've gone up, plugged in, found the width of this, or height, and then the width, whatever that area was. What is that area, by the way? How wide is it? 2, how high is it? So you have to know what the function is, right? I'm using the x squared function. So how high is this? 9, right? 3 squared is 9. So 9 by 2. 9 by 2 is 18. So that one's 18. This one is 2 wide also. How tall is it? 5 squared is 25. So 25 times 2 is 50. So 50 and 18 would be 68. And that's my approximation. Again, that approximation sucks com compared to the true value. So I go with three rectangles. And now look, it's 58.5. Keep going, 54, 4 rectangles, 5 rectangles, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The more I have, look at what's happening. This approximation is getting closer and closer and closer, isn't it? Now let me back this back out to 1. Now remember I said you could take the right endpoint, go up and go over. You could do the left endpoint. So this time I'm taking the 1 and I'm going to the right. Look at this estimate. 1 squared is 1. How wide is it? 4. 1 times 4 is 4. So my estimate's 4. I'm way under the true area. So I add a second rectangle. So notice, left endpoint go up and over. Left endpoint up and over. You see the difference between left and right? Yes? This is giving me an underestimate. I'm under the true value. But if I keep adding more and more in again, I start to converge to the true value. 
And what would happen if I let it go? Let's see how far I have this going out to. 70, right? 40.64. The true value is 41.33. Is that close enough? That would depend on what you need to do with this, right? I mean, if you're building a, you know, ball bearings, your tolerances probably can't be off by that much. You need it to be a little better. So, I mean, how would we get better? We do more. And it turns out that in the real world, a lot of times we don't have easy ways of getting exact answers. We have easy ways of getting approximations. And the thing is, how far out do you need to go? How many decimal points do you need? And that will depend on the application. So, okay. Bring this back. There's also something called using the midpoint, where instead of going and using the left and going up and over, or using the right and going up and over, you just go into the middle and go up and go out both sides. Now, look, that first approximation is 36. I mean, we're pretty close right away, right? Go to the, my second approximation, 40 already. 40.7, 41, look, I'm getting there pretty close. I mean, pretty fast, right? I'm getting pretty close to the true answer. I'm already within a tenth of it. Let's see how many iterations. Look at that, I'm at like 40 iterations of this and I'm within what, one one hundredth of the true value? That seemed to work a lot better, didn't it? Well, here's the thing. It doesn't matter. Right end point, left end point, middle end point, any point in between, does not matter where you start. When those rectangles get narrower and narrower and narrower, more narrow? Hmm. More narrower. Let's use that one. I like that. Right? It doesn't matter. It all converges. All right, well, I hope you understand the geometric part of what's happening here. Um, let me continue. I'm trying to, de I'm debating right now whether or not I want to get into the, the Riemann sums. I, I think I'm not going to have us actually calculate this example. I, I, think, I think that you all will be able to follow me when I get to the general formula. So, if we do left and right endpoints, doesn't matter. We're going to get we're going to get different answers, but the more rectangles we have, the better we we would the better results we'd get. So let's review some stuff before I actually get into the Riemann sums. Some some notation. Have you all seen this before? Capital Greek S sigma k equals one to n a sub k. All this means is you start at one, you put a sub one, and then add to it. Now you let n go up, or k go up by 1, so a sub 2, then plus a sub 3, and you stop when you get to n, so whatever this is up here. Here's an example. The sum k equals 1 to 3 of 1 plus 2k squared. So the first thing I do is I replace k with 1. That's right here. Plug it in, square it. That gives me 3 squared. Then I plug in k is 2, do the same thing. Case three, do the same thing, add it up, you should get 83. This one, you can do this yourself. This is one to the one, plus two to the two, plus three to the three, plus four to the four, and you stop, add those up, whatever it is. Why am I adding between each one? Not multiplying. Summation, that's what summations do. There's actually one that, that um, there's another symbol we use if we want to multiply instead. We use capital pi. It's called a product. So it would be written the same way. Instead of sigma, you go like this. That would mean a1 times a2 times a3 times a4 instead of a1 plus a2 plus a3. Just You probably won't ever use that in this. Well, we won't use it in this class for sure product p so that's why right so the sigma capital s sum p capital p product 
All right, so common sums. <clears throat> there are some sums that, that everyone needs to know exist. Um, there's formulas for it, for them. This is the first one. Sum k equals 1 to n of k. That means you're going to start with 1 and then add 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, and 7. You add them up until you get to some number n. If you do that, it's just n times n plus 1 over 2, always. So if you want to add up the first 200 numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way to 200, all you have to do is 200 times 201 divided by 2, and that would give you 20,100, which is a lot better than actually having to sit there and add up 1 plus 2 up to 200, right? That formula will always work. Then if you want to do the sum of the squares, <coughs> k equals 1n of k squared, that's 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, all the way to n squared, then the formula is different, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And then if you want to do the sum of cubes, 1, one cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed all the way to n cubed, the formula is, it's actually kind of neat, it's this formula squared. And then there's formulas for like 1 to the 4th plus 2 to the 4th plus 3 to the 4th, but that's about all we're going to investigate, all right? Just be aware of those because I'll refer back to those formulas in a little while. A couple of properties of sums that we need to know about. Sorry, I should have done that earlier. If you have the sum and sum from 1 to n and you have a constant in here, you can pull the constant out and figure out what the sum is. Then multiply times the constant. Here's an example. If I want to know what this is, I could have pulled the 3 out, then done k squared. What's the sum k equals 1 to n of k squared? What's this piece right here? Isn't that formula I just showed you? Which is this. But then the 3 is out front. So you, pe you peel the 3 off, figure out what that is, and then multiply the 3 back through. If you have this uh, summation and you have the sum of two different things, you can split it into two sums. Does not work for multiplication. Does not work for multiplication. Here's an example. If you have sum of k plus k squared, you split it into two, and then these two go to the formulas. Questions? I know this is really dry and boring right now. This is the same thing. I don't know why it went back. Let's try this one. I want to find a formula, a formula for the estimated area under f of x equals x squared on the interval 1, 5 using n rectangles and right endpoints. So I would really like to see how you follow this. Our, our end game goal here is to have a formula that works for every function. But I've got to start with the function. At least we have some idea of what's going on. So let's just draw a quick little graph. Actually, I'm going to make it kind of big. Don't draw a tiny little graph on your paper if, you're, if you are taking notes. Right, give yourself some room. Here's one, two three, four, five. And then x squared is going to look like this over here. It's going to go up. That's supposed to be a parabola, sorry. That's x squared. And that's on the interval 1, 5. What I'd like to do is cut this into n rectangles. It would be better if I said, let's cut it into, what, four rectangles? Because then you would know exactly where things were here. But you're going to have n of them. So let's, 
I'm really hoping that I, I didn't push too far. Let's just imagine that you have a bunch of rectangles in here, okay? Bunch of little rectangles in there. There's N of them. Each one of them is the same width. They're equal width. So I'd like to, to take one rectangle only. Right there. I'd like to take this rectangle over here to the side. I'd like to talk about it. How wide is this rectangle? What's its width? Four divided by n. It's the whole. It's the width of the whole interval. What's the width of the whole interval? Well, five take away one, right? So I'm going to write this down like this. It's five take away one. That's your four. I'm just showing a little more detail because we're going to generalize this in a minute. Divided by n. Is that? Do you, everyone agree that's your width? I'm going to call this delta x. This is delta little triangle, delta x. This is the change as I move from one triangle to the next. That's how much the x value changes by every time, right? How tall is this rectangle? x squared, right? It's the function's value at x, but do you know where you are? Do you, I mean, right now you don't know where you are, right? So it's the function's value, whatever the hell that is, right? I'm going to put a little, um, what we call a tilde over the x. That tilde is just telling you that you don't quite know where the x is right now. We know that it's somewhere in this rectangle. We are going to want it to be on the right side, aren't we? But the tilde is just to make you aware that it's not just randomly anywhere. It's got to be somewhere in that triangle or in that rectangle. So if I could figure out what that x tilde was, then what would the area of that be? What would the area of this whole thing be? The, just the yellow thing. F of x tilde times delta x. Yes? Whatever, whatever the height is times the little width. That would be the area of just this. Okay, so that's all just side note for us, all right? Now, back to our number line. This x1 right here, or sorry, this uh, 1, I'm going to define that to be x sub 0. That's my first x coordinate. And if I actually drew a rectangle here, a little bit more defined, would that be the right endpoint or the left endpoint of that first triangle? That would be the left. So I'm not really interested in that one, am I? I'm interested in the next one. What is x sub 1, which would be here? x sub 1 would be what? One plus delta x, exactly. It's 1 plus whatever that change is, right? That change is 4 over n. But I'm just going to write as 1 over delta x. What would x sub 2 be? That would be the next, the next uh, bottom corner of the next rectangle. What would that be? You could look at it two ways. It's either x1 plus delta x, right? The one before it plus delta, or... It could be the 1 plus 2 delta x's. Do you all see that what we're doing is we're starting here at 1. I'm going to blow that up. Here's 1. We're starting here, and to jump, we're jumping to the next one by adding delta x. To jump to the next one, we have to add another delta x. So you could say that the second right endpoint was just 1 plus 2 of those. And the next one would be what? 1 plus 3 of those? What would the last endpoint be? 
How many rectangles do I have? N, right? What would the nth rectang rectangle be? The right endpoint. 1 plus N delta X. Does everyone follow this? It's just, it's just keeping track of how many jumps you have. One of them, two of them, three of them, N of them. Now, remember over here where we had tilde? We said tilde was some x value in that rectangle. And I said we were going to want it to be the right endpoint. Aren't these, starting at 1, aren't these all the right endpoints? Not 0. 0 is the left endpoint. But x sub 1 would be the right endpoint of the first rectangle. x sub 2 would be the right endpoint of the second rectangle. x sub 3 would be the right endpoint of the third rectangle, and so on and so forth. So I actually have a formula for this, and I can nail it down to the specific rectangle, can't I? Okay. So let's see if we can put this all together. We're, we're getting close. Do you agree with this? The area of the kth rectangle is... F of 1 plus K times delta X times delta X. The area of the kth rectangle. I'll call it A sub K. So you're going to start at 1. You're going to move to the right. K delta X is, that'll take you to the right end point of the K rectangle. Whatever that point is, you plug it into the function. So we wind up plugging this into the function, which you'll just square it, right? That'll give you your height. Your width will be delta X. That's the area of the Kth one. To approximate the total area, what do we need? To add them all up, right? All N rectangles. So that's the area of the Kth. The area of all n rectangles is area equals sum k equals 1 to n, because I have n rectangles, of f of 1 plus k delta, uh, delta x times delta x. So that would be your, your what? First rectangle area plus your second, then your third, then your fourth, then your fifth, all the way till you get to n. Do you all follow that? Okay. Go to the next page. So now for this specific problem, right, recall f of x is x squared, right? That's what it is. That's the function that we're talking about here. And we are looking on the interval, what was it, 1, 5? The 1 was very valuable here, wasn't it? What did the 1 give us? Th that piece right there, right? That 1 came from here. And how is the delta x determined? We did that earlier also. Delta x was 5 minus 1 over n, wasn't it? So it looks like we can actually figure out for this problem what delta x is. It's going to be 4 over n. So I can replace these with 4 over n. And then I can also take this entire expression and I can plug it in to this function. And that will give me the area of the n rectangles. So here it is. The area will be sum k equals 1 to n of f. I'll, I'll actually plug in in a second. I wanted to first plug in delta x.
All I did here is replace delta x with 4 over n. And yes, you could multiply k times 4 and make this 4k. You could. Don't, though. Right? Don't. Not yet. Just leave it alone. You okay with this? All right. So when you have a sum, k equals 1 to n, what's changing on each sum? What's the thing that you change for each iteration of it? The k, the k changes, right? The k? So would you agree that 4 over n never changes? Right? Unless I change the n up here, but this doesn't change. So do you agree that this is really a constant? So I can just pull this out of the sum. Then I'm going to take this, and I'm actually going to plug this into the function. What happens when you plug 1 plus k times 4 over n into the function? The function just squares it, doesn't it? Oh, I forgot to put the squared. Questions on that? Because remember, the original problem was to, to estimate the area under x squared. So if I changed the problem and I said I made this x cubed, this would change this to x. This would be cubed. If this was sine x, then this would be sine of all this junk right here. Any questions with this? Let's square it. Tell me what you get when you square that. First term would be 1, right? And then plus, you'll have two of those pieces here, wouldn't you? So could I write that as k times 8 over n? You'll know what I'm doing, right? I'm doing this thing. Get that. Plus, what's the last term? Euler. K times K, K squared, 4N times 4 over N times 4 over N, 16 over N squared. Do we agree? I have the sum of three different things, don't I? Sorry, one, two, three things. I have a sum of three things being added up. Can't I break this into three sums according to the property? I'm going to put a big bracket out here. Sum k equals 1 to n of 1 plus 8 over n sum k equals 1 to n k plus 16 over n squared sum k equals 1 to n of k squared. Close the bracket. So what did I do on these? Yeah, see this k times 8 over n, the 8 over n is not affected by the k. So I pull the 8 over n out of this sum and just leave the k there. This one, 16 over n squared, same thing, pull it out and I'm left with the sum k squared there. You're good? OK. All right. Two of these I claim we know what to do with. This one and this one, because I told you there was a formula for these, right? This just means 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way to n. This means 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared all the way to n squared. So going back and looking at your formulas, we'll get those in a second. We didn't talk about what this was, though. What do you think that is? K 
equals 1 to n of 1. Doesn't that mean you start at k equals 1, right? Start at k equals 1, and you just put down what? 1. Plus, now you let k be 2, but that doesn't affect it. It's still 1 again. Plus, now you let k be 3, and you write down 1 again. And how many times do you do this? n times. So how many 1s do you have? n of them. So what's the answer? n. So the sum k equals 1 to n of 1 is just n. As long as k starts at 1, that's what happens. All right, so here we're almost there. 4 over n. Okay, this one right here, what did this turn into? n plus this one is 8 over n times n times n plus 1 over 2. That was the formula. Plus 16 over n squared. And then what was this formula for k squared? Did anyone write it down? n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Yeah, the cubed one is the one that's squared. So we have n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. There we go. There's no more sums, right? There's no more sums. You give me an n now, and I'll tell you what the area is, my approximation. We're taking x squared. We're looking between 1 and 5. We're cutting it into n rectangles. This is the total area of all n rectangles. Now hang tight because I want you to go back. I want to go back and take a look at what it is we're doing here. Here's x squared, right end point. We're looking between 1 and 5, right? And we did how many rectangles, n of them? Let's just try something. How about, one, how about one rectangle? What should the answer be? 100. Let's just look at our formula. What would happen if we plug in 1? Shit. We would get what? 4 here. Let's see, 1. This would be 8. What would this be up here? 2. 2 over 2? 1. So we're at what? I forget where we are. Who cares? Um, what is this? 2... Six, that's a six. So that's a one. Sixteen, I believe. Did I lose something here. Sixteen, two, eight, and one. Is that sixteen, eight, and one? That's twenty-five. All if you plug one into this, believe that you get twenty-five here. And then what's four divided by one? Four or four times twenty-five? A hundred. It matches what we got geometrically, right? But the beauty of this is this will work for any n. Right? If I want 100 rectangles, I plug 100 into this, and it gives me the estimated area. Understand? So really, there's no calculus yet in what we've done. There's no calculus at all. Here's the calculus. This is the finale, right? If we want to know the true area, what we do now is let n go to infinity. If n goes to infinity, now we have an infinite number of rectangles, right? So they're getting like narrow, you know, more narrower, infinitesimally small widths. And so you, you're going to converge to the true area that way. So let's take this right here and let's now define the true area to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of everything we just got. Right here. Oh, man, I'm out of room. I'm out of room. I have to go to the next page.
the area true will be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of this. The true area underneath that graph is this limit. So let's see how much Cal 1 we, we remember. What's 4 over infinity going to? 0. So you think the whole thing's going to 0? Well, now you have to figure out what else is happening. What's this going to? Infinity. What about this? This is up top. Where's that headed? Infinity, bottom. Infinity. So you have infinity over infinity. Infinity over infinity, you don't know what that is. You don't know yet. You have to figure it out. This one over here is infinity over infinity. So what we have is a bunch of indeterminate forms combined together. We've got to figure out what's happening to this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to distribute the 4 over n through the parentheses. All that's going to do is just add a factor of n to all the denominators. Limit, n goes to infinity. My first term, what's 4 over n times n? 4 plus, let me clean this up, 8, oh, you know, I won't clean it yet, 8 n times n plus 1 over 2n squared. The next one, 16 n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1 over 6n cubed. So all I did was added a factor of n to all the bottoms, right? Just kind of put them together a little bit. The next thing I'm going to do is actually distribute 8n through, 8n through. Did I not multiply? Oh, the 4, thank you. Well, it's still out here. I'm cheating. Oh. I'm cheating. I just, yes, thank you for catching that. Yeah, that four I didn't put through. Can I just leave it out there for now? I, I'm going to bring it through now because I forgot it. Oh, I did in the first one, but not the second one. Thank you. Yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. I forgot it on the last one. Is that what you were saying? And the second one. Shit. I only did it to the first one. So that was a four. This one, 32. Thank you. This one, 64. Now limit and goes to infinity of 4. All right, plus 32n squared plus 32n over 2n squared. Yes, I know I could have canceled some reduced fractions and stuff as far as like the numbers. I'm just leaving it for now. Oops, plus. 64. And then what is what is all this multiplied together? Should be, I, I'm going to do it for you. It's 2n cubed. The next one will be, let's see, n, 3n. It's 3n squared. And then the last one is n. Does anyone know why I'm doing all this multiplying out? Why I'm doing all this? Is it just for fun or? Yeah, so look, I mean, there's something is going to, something should probably happen pretty good here. Um, at the end of it, I mean, we should get a number, right? The more rectangles, we, sh we should hopefully get a number that this is converging to. What I'm trying to get everyone to see, this is infinity over infinity. And this one is also infinity over infinity. And whenever we have infinity over infinity, we love to use L'Hopital's rule. Exactly. Okay, I don't have the clicker, so just show of hands. You have seen L'Hopital's rule before. Show of hands. Okay. If you're not raising your hands, you're in trouble. Not with me, but you're in trouble with the math. Because 
OPTEL's rule is very, very important in this class. We'll use it here. We'll use it later in series. So if this is unclear to you is what I'm talking about, please get with me. I can give you something to look at to get you kind of up to speed with it. L'Hopital's rule says anytime you have infinity over infinity or zero over zero, when you're taking a limit, that you can just take the derivative of the top and bottom separately and then look at that limit. Try and figure out what that is. So let's, let's see here. This goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. What's the derivative of the top? 64 n plus 32, what's the derivative of the bottom? 4n, okay, let n go to infinity again. What do you have? Infinity over infinity. So L'Hopital's rule says if you have it again, you do it again, right? What's the derivative of the top and bottom again? 64 over four, which is eight. So what you know is that as n goes to infinity, this ratio goes to eight, right? I'm just working that one straight down. What about this one right here? Four never changed, right? Four plus, this one's going to eight. How about this one? I never distributed the 64 through. Maybe we should do that. Do you want to distribute it through or do you care? Wasn't it what? Where? Oh, God. <laughs> I think my brain's done. Yeah, no. 64 divided by 4 is not 8. 8 squared is 64. I have no idea where that would happen right there. Short circuit, I guess. All right, here. Yeah, I'll, I'll distribute it through. 128 n cubed plus, does this really matter, everything else? No, because when you do L'Hopital's rule enough, all that's going to happen to these, these are all going to go to zero. And you're just going to really get the 128 over 6. So I'll let you do your own distri distribution in L'Hopital on that, but you should get 128 over 6, which reduces, but... Let's see what this is. 20 plus, what is 128 over 6? Let's reduce it. 2 goes in there, what, 60 or 3? Does that go in? Is that it? 20 plus 64 thirds? Let's get a common denominator. You're not allowed to go to your calculator and get a decimal here. This is, what, 60 thirds plus 64 thirds, which is 124 thirds. That is the exact area underneath that curve. Which as a decimal is what? 41.3333333, which matches up with what we had Right here, 41.33333. That's how it's done. Well, that's what Riemann sums are. You start with the function. You come up with this algorithm. You figure out what everything is. It, this algorithm relies very heavily on us being able to convert these two sums over to formulas to get rid of these summations. Without these formulas, we couldn't do it. But a computer could, right? You could ask a computer to add up a million things pretty quickly. All right. So what's going on? Y'all seem way out of it. Is this just that dry? This material is just that dry or what? Or am I just getting picking up the wrong vibe here? All right, let's try and come up with a general formula, all right? That was an example of how we do a function Where is it? Here we go. Yeah, all right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to act like we don't know what the function is, 
and we don't know what the interval is. And we're going to see if we can come up with a formula for the area with just knowing, you know, hey, we've got a function f and we've got an interval a, b. All right? See if we can do it. So for those of you who are still with me, Let's start with delta x. You're going to have n rectangles in here, right? A bunch of rectangles in here. Tell me how wide each rectangle is going to be. What was it in the last problem? <clears throat> 4 over n? How would you get that? You did 5 minus 1, right? Here, we don't know what it is. We don't know if that's 5 or 10 or what. We don't know if that's 1 or 0 or negative 10. <clears throat> but delta x will always be the width of the interval, b minus a, over n. That's how wide each rectangle is. That will never change if they're all equally equal widths. That being said, tell me what my first point is. Hey. So, see, someone's going to have to give me a function, right? And they're going to have to give me an interval. I'm going to know what f is. I'm going to know what a and b are. But I need to come up with the formula. And that, so I'm going to rely on the b and a to get my delta x. I'm going to rely on the a for my starting point. What's x1 going to be? a plus delta x, which is the same as a plus b minus a over n. I left a space there for a reason. What's x sub 2 going to be? a plus how many of those? 2 delta x's, which is the same as a plus 2 times b minus a over n. x sub 3, a plus, OK. I wonder if I should just start calling on people. That's like old school. We can do that, or maybe y'all can. Because the same people keep on answering. I want, I want a little more participation. So anybody else want to tell me what's next? 3 delta x. So a plus. 3 times b minus a over n. All right, good. Is that enough to get a general formula? OK. What would the kth point be? a plus k delta x, which would be a plus k times b minus a over n. So let's take an arbitrary rectangle up here. What's its area? Just the area of that one, the area of the kth rectangle. What is it? F of, because we don't know what F is, right? F of, where are you, left and right? You're, you're at the kth point, aren't you? So x sub k times, now the width, delta x. Agreed? Now let's write that in terms of a, a more general. What is x sub k? We just said it was a plus k times b minus a over n. Right? That's a sub k or k x sub k is this. And what was delta x in terms of b and a? B minus a over n. Good. 
That is the area of the kth rectangle. What do we want to do with this? Add them all up. And how many of them do we want? Infinitely many at some point, right? This is it. I mean, that is the big daddy part of everything. You have to see that that gives you the area of each rectangle. Add them up. Let the number of them go to infinity. So here's our final formula. The area is... Back to the notes. Ah, uh, no, that's too soon. Sorry, I can't give it away yet. The area is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum k equals 1 to n of f of a plus k times b minus a over n times b minus a over n. I'll put that last B minus A over N in parentheses just to kind of stress to you that this is separated from all this. So if somebody gives me a function and interval, I should be able to come up with a formula. Whether or not I can actually figure out what that limit is, that's a different question. Right? That is a different challenge. All right. I think we'll have a little more practice w with using that formula, but, but not now. I think it's time to reveal the, the big point of all this, right? I mean, this was just to give you an appreciation for Riemann sums. The whole idea of the area comes from the idea of this summation. Do you remember what I told you about the, uh, the integral symbol? Do you remember what I told you about it? It comes from a sum, right? But it's not just a sum, it's a special sum. So we have what's called this, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the fundamental theorem of calculus actually connects the derivative and antiderivative together. And what we get is this, and I'm not going to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. Some instructors do, I'm not going to. If you're a math major, you'll get plenty of chances to do that. I want you to take a look at this formula. Suppose f is a function defined on AB. That's what we just did, right? We just came up with a formula for the area underneath that. The definite integral of f from A to B, definite, now it's a definite integral instead of indefinite, is the number, so focus your attention on this right here. What is that? Limit n goes to infinity, right? That's what we just did. That's the area, right? Somehow, that area is equal to this. This is just a notation, right? This right here is a notation for this limit. That's all it is. And you can kind of see where it comes from. The f of x comes from the height of the function, all right? That's where that comes from. And the dx comes from this, which we called what? Delta X, but see, because there's an infinite number of them now, we're not calling it DX, we're calling it the differential, which is infinitesimally small, instead of, you know, 4 over N, which could be like 1 fifth or 1 tenth or something. It's an infinitesimal value. And then what we do is we tack on the A and the B, which represent the two endpoints. If this limit exists, because not every, not every function you can find the area under, Think about functions that have asymptotes, which we will do. Right? Those may not have a, an area that we can find that's finite. If the, if the limit exists, then we say the function is integrable. Integrable, that's a new word. Integrable on AB. So if the limit exists here, we say the function is integral on that closed interval. Now, the evaluation theorem, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus I was just referring to, says this that if you want to know what that limit is, the one we just did by hand, right? If you want to know what it is, all you have to do is find capital F of X. What's capital F of X? The antiderivative, right? And then plug in B to it, and then plug in A to it, and subtract the two, and you've got it. So... This is um, fundamental, 
right? It's a fundamental different task. This is a fundamental result. This is an awesome thing because it saves us from Riemann sums. It saves us from having to do Riemann sums. So I'm going to show you that in action. Let's take this same problem we just did. What was our answer? Not, not the general one, the one right before it. 124 thirds. All the work that we had to go through to get to that, right? Let's do it using the, what we just put up. The area under f of x equals x squared on the interval 1, 5. Use the fundamental theorem of calculus. I want you to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the area. So first, some notation. We are going to try and do this integral, this definite integral. So the integral of x squared dx, that's something we've dealt with in the past. The fact that we have a 1 and a 5 here now changes things. This means this, is, this answer is a number, not a, not a function. So what we do first in the fundamental theorem of calculus is we find the antiderivative. What is the antiderivative x squared? One third x cubed, good. So we just write that down, and then we put this bar next to it. This is gonna be, this bar is gonna remind us that we still need to evaluate this antiderivative at two points, at one and at five. The reason why we normally put this is because we wanna give ourselves a position to actually come up with the antiderivative and write it down. Once we do that, then we do this. So I'm referring to this right here. This is that antiderivative with that bar with the B and the A. What this means is this. Plug in B, write it down. Then plug in A, write it down, subtract the two. So what happens when you plug in B? Plug, plug 5 into that. 1 third times 5 cubed, right? Minus, now plug in 1. 1 third times 1 cubed. And what do you get? 125 thirds minus 1 third, which is 124 thirds. And it's not coincidental. That is, that is the fundamental theorem of calculus. That is the beauty of the antiderivative. If you have a function and you want to find the area under it, you just have to find, be able to find the antiderivative. You can find the antiderivative, you just plug in. And it's done. This is good news, right? So why show you the Riemann sums? Why not just give you that? I mean, I didn't have to show you the Riemann sums, right? And all the formula and stuff. Didn't have to. I could have just handed that to you. But here, there's a reason why. It's where we're headed. We're going to be trying to come up with formulas for things other than areas. We're going to be taking something like, I'll do it up here. We're going to be taking something like, all right, take a, take a semicircle, that, or a quarter of a circle, okay? We could find the area under that, right? Couldn't we? Now, we could, if we could somehow find the function that draws that red curve, find its antiderivative, we could find the area. But what we're going to do is we're going to take that and we're going to wrap it around the x-axis. So imagine taking that curve and wrapping it around the x-axis. And it would create this, this shape, right? As it went around the x-axis. The x-axis is going through here, through the center, coming out the other side like that. Do you all see it? And that shape has a volume to it. And we want to know what the volume of that shape is. To do that, we're going to talk about what happens to little slivers, little slices. Remember that rectangle that we found the formula for? We're going to take that slice and we're going to see what does that slice look like over here? What does it look like, by the way? If I wrap that around, doesn't it look like a little, a little disky looking thing like that. Do you know the volume of a disk? Pi r squared times height. So if you can come up with the formula for this, then that represents just one little sliver in here, right? 
then I want to add up all the slivers, right? Adding up the slivers means the sum. All of them, infinite sum, infinite sum integral. See, so I'm trying to get you to see with the Riemann sums that it's not just about showing you and then saying, oh, and here's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Ha, ha, ha. We didn't have to do all that crap. No, it's because geometrically later you need to understand what's happening to each rectangle slice if it's moved around or if we wrap it around the x-axis or the y-axis or we move the whole thing up and wrap it somewhere. Understanding what happens to that one little sliver is vital to being able to come up with the answer. Okay, so hopefully it's, you'll see later, all right, how that's going to hopefully benefit you. But it's a great thing. It's like I'm telling you, you had to run a marathon, but really there's this door you can go and you'll be at the finish line. You know, it's like, great. All right, I, that's probably enough information for you to process for the day, don't you think? I've put my old test up there a few times for you to look at. I'm going to just scroll through it again. You're free to go. But I don't feel like posting this test. Like, I don't feel like putting it out there in an electric format, so I'll force you to have to go back and watch the video if you want to see it. There was number one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. There. Good? No. Two. We did that one. Three. Four. If you watch any of these videos on YouTube, um, Keep in mind that you got to let it run for like at least a minute before it'll catch up and like get real clear. If you just watch like the first minute, usually it's kind of blurry, but once it like buffers, it gets like really, really clear. Um, anything else? Do y'all have any questions for me? Uh, yes. yes. You know, I I don't like to. Uh, narrow your focus like I don't want you to think that those eight problems are the only ones you should worry about you know am I making sense homework review your homework you, you've been keeping up with that hopefully um, problems that were done in class and the exam problems I just showed you I mean th that's really it if you if you can get through most of the homework problems and the problems that I demonstrated in class, and the exam problems I had up here, I think you're in good shape. Time is going to be the most critical factor, time. Because that problem I gave you that you all turned in, how long did that take you? You know, 10, 15 minutes, maybe more. If that's just one part of one problem, imagine that'll be, that'll be the pressure behind you the whole time is that clock running can you get through all these problems in time? So, any other questions? Oh yeah, good. So what am I going to give you? I'll give you the trig sub formula. Um, what do y'all think about the partial fractions? Y'all okay with that? What I'll do on partial fractions is this: if you need that strategies for partial fractions, if you need that, then I'll let you use it. But if you don't use it, you get if you don't use any formula sheets except for the ones you can print off on the website, right? So if you don't use partial fractions and you don't use the trig sub, if you don't use any formulas, you get a five point bonus on the test. Automatic to start. If you require formulas, then you can use the trig sub ones and the partial fractions. Should I provide them for you or are you going to provide them yourself? Provide them yourself? Okay. So provide them yourself. Don't write on them, though. Don't have all these other ancillary notes on them. Don't know where to get them? Okay. Calculators. You can use a calculator. I, as long as you don't have stuff stored in there that you're cheating, you can use it. If it's asking you to find the antiderivative, if, if you're being asked to find the antiderivative, which the whole test is, you can't just TI-89 it and get the answer and be like, but it's the right answer. I mean, I have to, sh I have to see the technique. 
I have to, it has to be clear how you did it. It can't be just like so messed up and, and, and like messy that I'm confused, but the answer is there, you know, because the TI-89 gave you the answer. So, yeah, but you can check your answer. That's a good thing. You got to be careful with that sometimes, though, because sometimes the answer on the calculator is right and yours is right. They don't look the same. So. All right. 